<sighs> and we'll continue talking about dynamic scheduling. We just got into dynamic scheduling. We're looking at our pipeline right now. We're drawing it from left to right, and we talked about how we can um, we can have multiple pipelines that proceed in parallel. The scoreboard is one of, or perhaps the earliest mechanism for keeping track of dependencies between instructions that are in different pipeline stages of parallel pipeline. The simplest scoreboard uses a single bit. I think before we may have called it a valid bit. We're going to change it to call it a ready bit. So R, R is for ready. When we have in order dispatching, meaning we dispatch all of the instructions that go through issue together, we dispatch them all simultaneously. Um, so the same sort of the, the same issue window is all in order. And then we have a in order pipeline, then it's fine to just use this one ready bit. As we make our pipeline less and less strict in terms of being in order, then we're going to have to make this um, tracking mechanism more complicated because as instructions become more and more out of order with respect to each other, keeping track of their dependencies becomes harder. Our basic scheme here is that our issue stage logic is going to be reading the scoreboard. It reads the scoreboard and the register file at the same time. In fact, often the scoreboard is uh, partially integrated with the register file. So you can think of these R bits as being appended to each register in some sense, like a, a metadata for the register. So we read our operands and their uh, ready bits, and then we can proceed to dispatch if all of the operands are ready. And if they're not ready, then we just stall, and we, we pull the forwarding lines typically, which includes the write back to the register file. So we pull our, uh, our forwarding or bypass network, watching for those um, values to be uh, ready. And then when we dispatch, we dispatch all of the instructions in the same issue window together, and we clear the ready bit of the destination registers for all of them. And doing that in the dispatch action there ensures that the next instructions that enter issue will observe that the ready bit is clear if they need that uh, destination as one of their sources, right? So the, the clearing of the ready bit in the scoreboard ensures that subsequent instructions will stall until the, um, the destination value is in fact available or it's ready. We'll, we'll produce the value of the, the destination value on the bypass network every cycle after it's ready or really the one cycle after it's ready in this pipeline diagram. And when we write back the value to the register file, then we'll set the ready bit of the destination inside of the scoreboard so that now when an instruction reads from that register, it will see that that value is ready. So that value that it gets out of the register file is a good value. So that is kind of a, a rough sort of uh, algorithm for how the scoreboard gets used with um, in order dispatch. So let's walk through an example. This is this is still considered static scheduling because we are still issuing all of the instructions together in program order. That and that's what is the scheduling piece of a processor. Scheduling means instruction scheduling means determining the order in which the instructions get to execute. So if we dispatch an order, that means that we're still um, we're still we're not doing any any scheduling inside of our processor. So it's static. So here's an example of some nasty looking C code with pointers which um, is, is, is a one-line piece of code that says star minus minus p equals star p plus one. What does that mean? Well, it means decrement p first and then assign it to 
the value of the next element in the array. That's what it means. Um, so that's that first line. The second line X is uh, dereferencing the next value of the array one plus P and adding that to some scalar value B and then decrementing the pointer again. And then the last line is accessing the third element offset from the current pointer position P. So this is just some nasty little piece of code that is purely for illustrative purposes and solely to confuse you um, and your understanding of C. If you understand what this is, then great. You're doing awesome at C programming. If you don't, don't worry about it too much. We're going to change it into uh, assembly anyway. So the compiler has to generate the assembly code that implements this. We'll assume that the pointer for P is in a register 29 and that the scalar value B is in the register 2. Um, and when I say scalar, I'm using it in the physics uh, sort of math physics sense of, um, of, uh, of an integer value. So uh, the compiler generates the code um, and we're going to avoid dependencies between instructions that might issue together because um, we want to issue, we want to dispatch all the instructions in order. So that means there can't be dependencies between them. Um, so that's what avoid intra issue dependencies, uh, meaning intra within, so within the same issue window. We don't have necessarily have aligned issue windows, so we may need to look at the issue width, and this is a two issue, and so we have to look pairwise at every instruction and make sure it's not dependent with the instruction that comes before it or after it. Um, so we can we can do that in the compiler, compilers can do that and avoid those dependencies and avoid hazards as well. Um, that would need us to stall the pipeline and that lets us keep the hardware a little cheaper. So our assumption here is a two issue I three O. So in order, um, in order fetch, in order decode, in order, um, well, sorry, in order front end, which is fetching and decoding, in order issue, in order uh, execute and out of order write back. With a one cycle, uh, with one integer ALU with a one cycle latency, that's our X pipeline, and one fully pipelined memory unit with a two cycle latency. So fully pipelined means that we can put a new instruction into that execute unit every single cycle. Some functional units are not pipelined, then um, they would not be able to take a new instruction every cycle. So if it was not a pipeline memory unit with a two cycle latency, we would not be able to put memory instructions into M1 every single cycle. We'd have to wait one stall cycle after every instruction that we dispatch to the M pipeline unit. Um, for the most part in this class, uh, I think I'm going to stick to fully pipelined units. Um, and I'll, I'll be I'll try to be very explicit whenever I get away from that. So that's our setup. Here is one way to generate the code that implements this uh, functionality. We load a value from the pointer P. Uh, we subtract that value by four and we store what we had loaded back into the subtracted line. These are pointer, cool. These first three lines here are implementing this first line there. So this load word is this star P plus one because P was decremented prior to P plus one. So P plus one is actually P on entry to this code. You know what, that, that, I made it too complicated. Maybe just take it as, as it is. And then we decrement P again, and um, and then we add the value B to the value of one plus P, which we still have, right? That one plus B and that one plus P are, are the same one plus P. And um, we store that back, um, sorry, load, load in P plus three, which is 12 offset from our current location. 
you don't have to convince yourself this is right. You can just take my word for it because I wrote it. And um, the compiler allocated a um, temporary register $1x and $31 for y. That's fine. Another better code generation is something called, um, uses something that is called static single assignment form in compilers, which means that you um, you only make one assignment to a variable. You never reassign a variable. So this transformation here, we don't reuse the name 29. Here we use the name 30. So before we had this, add i 29 29 minus 4 there's no reason we have to put this in 29 we can put this in 30 and what static single assignment form does is it gets is it um, eliminates name dependencies so in this case it eliminates the right after read dependency between these two instructions and um it also eliminates output dependencies so later on down here this add i, we now allocate register three for its result. So now we don't have an output dependence between these two add i instructions. So static single assignment form is a way for a compiler to deal with name dependencies, um, which is helpful in a multiple issue processor because we need to avoid any dependencies between instructions that issue together. So um, getting rid of name dependencies is going to help with that. Let's see, anything else worth talking about here? I don't, I don't think so. Then we've talked about instruction scheduling before. We can reschedule our SSA form into um, a slightly different form by, to avoid this this. Uh, so here, this load and this store, this is a load use hazard. Um, well, it's a load use dependency, right? So load um, into dollar $1 from this address and then store from dollar $1 to that address. Now, in a, in, a single, um, in a single issue machine, this is not a hazard. But in a two issue machine, this is a hazard because these two instructions issue and then these two instructions issue. So the load use between here to here can actually cause a hazard. You won't have this loaded value until two cycles after it actually dispatches. So you gotta push this store word farther down in order to avoid that load use hazard. And so that's what we do, we push it down. We still have a load use hazard from this load down to this add, um, but uh, we'll deal with that in a minute. Let's see, so we combine the two adds and we push our dependencies as far apart from each other as we can. And we avoid dependencies between pairwise instructions. So um, no, no true dependencies between these two, no true dependencies between these two, uh, no true dependencies between these two, and this is not a true dependency. These are both reading from $1 because stores read from their register operands. Oh yeah, and then we also schedule our um, instructions in order to alternate ALU and memory operations so that we avoid structural hazards. Um, if you remember, a structural hazard means two instructions require the same um, hardware resource at the same time. If we had two load instructions that tried to issue together, we'd have to serialize them in program order in the in the dispatch logic right because we can't put two load instructions into our memory pipeline uh, at the same time we can only issue or dispatch rather we can only dispatch one memory instruction per cycle so we've got our final code that is statically scheduled so the compiler did a lot of work to make this um, to make this right and and hopefully efficient and let's take a look at how it goes through our little two issue machine here. So in the beginning, we have some, uh, some. this is some register file here. So MIPS 32 registers, um, and they have some initial values. What's important is the value of R29 and the value of R2. R29 is our pointer P, R2 is our scalar B. 
The other values are just made up garbage that exist from whatever register value, whatever values that register happened to be storing from the last time it was written to. We skip ahead to cycle three. Cycle one and cycle two is fetching and decoding. So in cycle three, we're issuing these first two instructions together. Um, so we read the operands and the ready bits. All their operands are, are ready. $29 is ready. $1 is ready. So R29, R1, um, R29, and R3, they're all ready, which means both of these instructions are, are ready to dispatch. So we can dispatch both of them. Um, and that happens in cycle three. In this cycle three, while these two instructions are an issue, these two instructions, the following load and add, are in decode, and we're fetching this store word as well as whatever instruction comes after that store word. So um, now in the next cycle, cycle four, our load and our add are here. So add is in X1, load is in M1, and they clear the ready bits as they dispatch. So the destination R1 is not ready, the destination R3 is not ready. So they cleared their, their ready bits. And when this load and this add reach the issue stage and they check the scoreboard, they see um, that, oh, R1 is not ready. R1 is needed by the add. So we're gonna stall both of these instructions because we dispatch all the instructions in an issue window together. Now, you may be saying to yourself, well, that's awfully wasteful. Why wouldn't we let them trickle through the pipeline? Well, we just don't do that um, right now. To do that is going to complicate things. And so we'll do that later. Um, OK, so R1 is not ready. We stall them both. In cycle five, the add I here completes, and it writes back its value uh, into $3. So now R3 is ready. And the load word is in M2. It's still not finished. And so R1 is still not ready. So we're stalling again. And then finally, the load word completes and it writes its result back and provides its value on the bypass network. And at this point, all of the operands for these two instructions are ready. And so they can dispatch. In the next cycle, while well, these are dispatching, we clear the ready bits for 31 and 4. So R4 is not ready, R31 is not ready. Um, by the way, the value in R1 is now whatever value is at memory location of 4096. The value of R3 is equal to 4096 minus 8. Um, I, I skipped showing you that the values update, but the values updated. The operands R29 and R1 are both ready because R31 and R4 are not ready, but everything else is ready. So this store word can dispatch, and so it'll enter the memory pipeline the cycle after the load word does. The add completes. The load word is here in M2. The store word is here in M1. The load word completes, and then the store word completes. So it takes 10 cycles. Here's the multi-cycle pipeline diagram for this example. Cycle one, fetch these two instructions. Cycle two, decode them and fetch the next two. Cycle three, issue them and decode the next two and fetch the next two. Cycle four is where we have the stall. Um, so we're stalling the these two instructions in issue while the load and the, the add are in their execute pipelines. And we're still stalling and we have to stall um, we don't get to finish issuing until the write back of dollar $1, because that's what we're waiting for. So in cycle six, we get to finish issue, um, which means we dispatch. Cycle seven, we're actually executing, and um, we're able to issue um, the store word and this no op that I made up, and they proceed down the pipeline. So the, the true dependencies cause us to wait for the write back before we can finish issuing. Um, it, it is possible to know that you can issue a cycle sooner if you add a little bit more metadata. So if we, if we keep track of which instruction in the pipeline is going to produce the values we need, so we know we need $1. If we know that 
dollar one is going to be coming from an instruction that's in the M pipeline, we can actually predict when it's going to write back its value and have it ready. And we can actually send our instructions into their execute stage pipelines one cycle sooner, knowing that we'll be able to forward the value coming out of this load into X1. That's a little tricky, but that's what this is talking about here. Um, we're gonna we're gonna come back to that point again later. It, it takes a little bit more hardware, so we can't do that with just our one ready bit. We need to make our scoreboard more complicated in order to make that prediction possible. Increasing our issue width beyond two makes it really hard for the compiler to solve the static scheduling problem to to resolve the dependencies and make sure that the full issue window can go together. Um, Another thing we would like to do, we would like to execute ready instructions before waiting ones. In our example, we saw that that second load word has to wait for the add before it can go. And that's really not efficient. So what would happen if we allow execution to happen um, out of order or even to just break our in order dispatch um, or our, our dispatch the full issue window at a time. So the the problem is that if execution goes out of order, then having just this one ready bit that we clear during the dispatch is not enough to deal with hazards because we could have a problem where we dispatch uh, we dispatch an instruction before an earlier instruction in program order which is going to write to it. So we would need to be able to resolve that dependency. We can do that when those instructions are in the same issue window, we can do that. Um, it's just something that we have to be aware of. So that would be a write after write hazard because um, the instruction that we dispatch is going to write to RD and the instruction that's early in program order is gonna write to it. Uh, another problem that would exist with just our single bit dispatch protection is that we might dispatch before an earlier instruction that reads from that operand. And so this would cause a write after read hazard because um, we would stall that earlier program order instruction until we finish this, um, this out of order execution instruction, which would write the wrong value to the register that would get read. And then finally, we might dispatch after a later instruction that reads from the, um, the, the destination register, which would violate our true dependencies. Um, if the later instruction in program order comes earlier than we do. Um, this is uh, uh, inverse of this statement right here, right? We can fix the raw hazard if we clear the ready bit during the issue stage because we still are fetching and decoding in order so we can make sure that we would never um, dispatch after a later instruction in program order but that doesn't do enough to deal with the write after write and write after read hazards um, and so out of order execution is this idea uh, is essentially where we, we tip the line from static scheduling to dynamic scheduling because the processor is going to choose what order instructions go through the pipeline and so it's choosing really functionally the order of um, the program order in some sense. Um, and it, it introduces these write after write and write after read hazards. So there's a couple of different ways to deal with those. Um, one way is to, um, to modify the scoreboard to add uh, instruction status bits and functional unit status bits. So we can keep track of the, the state of different instructions and the state of different functional units. And then we can stall our issue stage when we detect a write after write hazard. And we can stall our write back stage to prevent writing after reading hazards. Um, so we basically allow an instruction to execute early, but then we serialize its write back so that a write backs in order, um, or at least in order enough to prevent the write after read. 
Um, I still have this note that this is in the Appendix C of Hennessy and Patterson. Um, I'm not. I'd have to I have to double check to see where it is in um, your textbook. I'm fairly certain it's in here somewhere, though. Wherever it talks about scoreboarding, that's where it'll be. Um, so this extended scoreboard with all these status tracking things and stalling, this is what is traditionally uh, meant when computer architects say a uh, superscalar processor was scoreboarding. However, there is another option, which is to use register renaming in hardware. So um, when the compiler generates uh, static scheduled instructions, it allocates new registers and it does that to avoid these name dependencies. Well, we can avoid these, uh, these name dependencies becoming hazards by doing the same thing, but in hardware. So we can allocate new registers or really new register names for the destinations of instructions. And register renaming combined with scoreboarding is actually a fairly elegant solution. Um, and it's not always particularly well understood that you can do this. Um, but it was done. It was done in, um, in a couple of processor families, actually. So let's talk about how register renaming works in the context of um, scoreboarding still. So we're going to introduce some new terminology here. We're going to have uh, architectural registers, uh, retirement, which is equivalent to what's sometimes called retirement registers. So architectural registers, rename registers, and physical registers. So we've got these three files, the architectural register file, also known as the retirement register file, this is the um, the ISA, the Instruction Set Architectures General Purpose Registers. So these are the registers that you see in the program when you look at it. So they're named based on the Instruction Set Architecture. So these are your general purpose and floating point registers defined by the ISA. Because um, you can apply all these same concepts to floating point instructions and floating point registers. The rename register file, sometimes called the future file, uh, is a is a is a register file that exists within the processor. It's not visible to programs, and it contains extra registers that the processor allocates dynamically to map architectural registers to renamed registers. So it's like a temporary variable in some sense, where you can allocate a temporary variable so that you have a different name for destinations. So it gives you a temporary place to put destinations um, and thereby allows you to rename destinations by allocating new storage for them. So in order to have the ability to rename registers, you need to have additional storage for the renamed registers. So that's what the, the rename register file is. Finally, the physical register file is a term for all of the registers that the processor or the machine actually has implemented inside of it. So this is the, the set of all of the general purpose and, and floating point registers of the processor. For the time being, we're going to consider the physical register file to be the union of the architectural register file and the rename register file. So we've got our storage in our ARF and our RRF. ARF, 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 ARF. I want a little seal there, right? In order to keep track of when we rename architectural registers to give them different names, we're going to also introduce this remap table. So the remap table is going to be indexed by the architectural register names. So it has the same indices as the ARF. And it's going to provide us with an index into the rename register file. So it gives us the new name of this register. And then inside the rename register file, that's where we can find its, um, its value and also its scoreboard state. So that's an overview of the structure. We're going to look at an example here in a moment. Here's a snippet 
of code that was derived from our first version uh, that wasn't statically rescheduled by the compiler. And I've drawn the true hazards here in um, in forward brown arrows, reddish brown arrows. And we've got the name dependencies in those backward gray areas, gray arrow, ah, gray arrows. The name dependency from add I back to the load word, right? This is purely there because we chose to use $29 for the result of this addition. The output dependence here and the anti dependence here as well. So these are our name dependencies, and we've also got some true dependencies. The true dependencies are not going to play a role here in renaming is solely to get rid of the name dependencies. So the, the output and anti-dependencies. So our initial state of our architectural register file is here as given in our initial setup. So we still got our value of B as 1024, our value of um, our pointer P as um, 4096. Currently, we don't have any remapped renamed registers at the start here. So we not we have nothing in our rename register file. When we have nothing, then nothing is ready. Um, and because there's no valid remappings, that means that when we read from the architectural register file, we actually get the value associated with that architectural register. We'll see what that means here in just a second. So again, using our two wide issue machine, in our uh, issue stage for this load word and add I, we're going to read our operands, and there's really just one operand that we read, and that's R29. And we check, we read the value of R29 out of the architectural register file, and we also read the, um, the remap tables row for R29. And when we find that it doesn't have a valid entry in the remap table, that means that the value we read from the architectural register file is good. If the, if the remap table had a valid entry, that would mean that R29 has been renamed. And so we have to check the rename register file to see what the value for R29 is. And if it's ready. And we'll see in just a moment an example of that. So we read the operands, we get the R if we check the remap valid bit. We find that it's not uh, that the remap is not valid, and so that means the ARF is valid. We allocate the destination registers, um, and so this is our renaming mechanism. So we rename R1 is now has a valid new name, and that name is zero. So rename register file indexed by value zero is now the the place where the architectural register $1 lives. So if you want the value of $1, you have to go into the rename register file. That value is not ready, right? It's not ready because it hasn't been loaded from memory yet. Similarly, we allocate the destination register of $29, and we allocate that to um, index one. And it also is not ready because we haven't finished this edition. And so moving forward, instructions that want to get the value of $29 have to go to the rename register file. So we do this allocation on every single um, issue. So every time we dispatch, we rename the destination registers. That way, when the next instructions come into the pipeline, we um, we check the the rename register file for their operands instead. So let's see. So we dispatch both of these ready instructions. We've already renamed their destinations, and so we can issue two more. And when we issue these two, they're actually going to find that well, we get our values of the architectural register files indexed by one and twenty nine. But we also get the remap tables indexed by 1 and 29, and we find that there's valid remappings, which means that we have to ignore what we read from the architectural register file because that's not correct. 
Instead, we have to go and look at the rename register file indexed by the index we found in the remap table. So store word is going to say, oh, well, I actually need to store word the value found in the rename register file at index zero to the address found by the effective address found by computing zero plus the value added to the rename register file indexed by one. Similarly, the add I is going to say, oh, well, I need rename register file one as my source operand. So we find that those operands are not, um, are remapped, but they're not ready. So remap of one, uh, remap of one is valid and the rename register file for indexed by the remap of one is not ready. So we have to stall the store word instruction and we have to pull the bypass network for the value of the rename register file zero being ready. And similarly um, for 29, this is going to cause us to stall store word and add I because they both need to wait for the value of 29 to be ready. We're going to allocate their destinations. So we're going to allocate $1 and $1.29 in this, um, in this stage, but we're going to stall this issue stage because they're not ready to proceed. Um, so we rename $1 again. So R1 is going to get a new index here in just a moment. We clear the ready bit for the, um, for the destination. I don't know if there's anything else left to say at this point. So we advance and what happens now, the, the add I here is in the write back stage. The load word is in the mem2 stage. So when we write back add I, it's going to set the rename register file indexed by one to true. Now the current index of R29 is actually two because we've renamed it for here, the, the second add I. But this add I has been carrying along its index in the register file with it, so it knows where to write its result to. So the add I writes the value 4092, which is just 4096 minus 4, 4092 into rename register file 1 and sets that operand as ready. And so that means that both of these instructions are now um, have their $29 ready. So rename register file one is true, is ready as true. So the store word and add I both read the rename register file one value. And the add I is ready to go. It has its operands, it's ready. So we can dispatch that add I out of order. So this is where we get our out of order execution from. We don't make this add I wait for the store word to be ready before it can go down the pipeline. So the store word is still watching for the rename register file indexed by zero because it still needs the value loaded from memory. Right, this is a load use hazard being fixed by stalling. So we're gonna stall store word. We still stall issue, but now there's only one instruction in issue being stalled. That's the store word instruction. On the next cycle, the load word finishes. Um, and so it writes the value that it loaded from memory into the rename register file. And the store word reads that value from the rename register file. And it then dispatches the store word, which is out of order from the dispatch of the add I. And we can unblock issue, which means we can um, resume fetching new instructions as well. Because whenever we stall issue, we have to install, uh, sorry, whenever we stall issue, we have to stall um, fetching and decoding or generally speaking, that's our front end. So the multi-cycle pipeline diagram for this example looks something like this. Um, we have our load and our add, they get fetched, decoded, issued. All of this happens in order so far because there was no dependencies to issue. Then when they issued together, well, we ended up stalling both of these to wait. But then when this add I finishes, we're able to get the value of 29 and start executing this add I. And then, um, and then after that, we were able to execute the store word. So we've got this out of order execute here. 
and we fixed the possibility of name dependencies causing hazards using the renaming mechanism. Uh, eventually, we do have to bring the rename register file values back out to the architectural register file. So we do need a mechanism for that. Um, we'll deal with that in a little little bit though, a little bit later, I think. So this is still a pretty simple scoreboard with renaming, uh, with register renaming. We're still just using this one ready bit, um, although I did cheat a little bit, but that's okay. Um, so we'll stall an instruction. Um, any instruction that stalls an issue has to stall um, the front end, so the fetch and decode from, from moving into the issue stage. And um, we can serialize dependent instructions that are in the same issue window now. Um, I didn't I didn't show you how to do that, but it's possible. It, it uses the same sort of logic as um, as issuing out of order allows us to serialize dependencies within an issue window. Um, an interesting side effect of this is that. Um, registers whose values change multiple times within the same sort of um, within a, a a limited distance of each other may not actually update the architectural register file. So R29 in this example never gets written with the value 4092. Um, so R29 is initially 4096, then it becomes 4092, then it becomes 4088. Eventually, this 4088 is what gets written into R29 in the architectural register file. So the register file never actually sees this value 4092, which is an interesting side effect of, um, of renaming. We do need to have a large enough rename register file to handle all of the in-flight instructions. So um, assuming that um, we have a two wide pipeline, so we can issue two instructions every cycle. Um, then we have to multiply two times the number of stages between issuing to write back to determine how many instructions can be um, in flight at a time. So in our pipeline, we have five stages from issue to write back. We've got one, two, three, four, and five. Issue X1, M1, M2, and W. And we rename an issue, so that's why it starts an issue, and um, the the names are sort of available to be um, to be collected again, I guess, or reused in write back. So two instructions being renamed an issue every single cycle would cause a maximum of ten different possible destinations that need to be renamed for all of the instructions between issue and write back. The deeper and wider your pipeline gets, the, the broader or bigger that rename register file has to become. Um, you also um, may need to make it slightly bigger if it takes more than just the write back stage to actually um, deallocate or free up names, if that makes sense. Um, in this pipeline, control hazards are still a, a challenge. Exceptions are not precise. We don't um, we don't know um, if if we issue the add. Well, add is a bad example, but anyway, if we execute the add before the store, actually that's okay, and the add finishes out of order, and then the store goes, and we find out that it's a bad address. That store generates a an address exception and the ad already finished and updated the architectural register file. Um, and so the state of the processor is not consistent with any um, program order state of the program. So that would be an imprecise exception. And then um, if we have a branch misprediction, we have to handle squashing the pipeline. And if we've issued and executed instructions out of order, before we've resolved the branch, then that could be a problem. And we also have to figure out when we write to the architectural register file. So we can make our issue stage 
out of order as well. So it's uh, inefficient to allow an instruction to dispatch and have one instruction in the issue stage and still block instructions from coming into issue from decode. So what we, what we would like to do is to trickle instructions into issue as they trickle out of issue. And we can do this with something called an IQ. Um, it, it goes by two names. It goes by issue queue or instruction queue, but either way it's called an IQ. So the issue queue sits between the decode and the issue stages, and it's a buffer for instructions, and the decode stage writes to it in, in order, so it's a FIFO. So first in, first out, written in order by decode, and then the issue stage reads or dequeues from the issue queue and program order as it dispatches instructions. So the issue logic uh, checks the issue queue and dispatches the earliest ready instructions from the issue queue. This way, the issue logic can check multiple instructions within a window, whatever the size of the issue queue is, for ready instructions. So it allows for more instructions to be considered at a time for dispatching, not just the two instructions that you've got in program order. And then as the issue logic dispatches from the issue queue, the decode can put new instructions into it. Um, it's not a FIFO. I, I, I shouldn't call it a FIFO because the issue logic can pluck instructions off of the issue queue out of order. Um, so here's an example of the issue queue. We've got a valid bit. We've got a dispatch bit. So D is for dispatched here. We've got the opcode of the instruction. We've got the immediate of the instruction. We've got the two register source operands and the destination register operand um, or, or memory operand. It could be either one. So the issue queue is um, is essentially an encode the the instruction broken down into its decoded components along with a couple of metadata bits. So, um, sorry, uh, we also have here, we've got a, a metadata bit on each register operand. And we're going to call that a pending bit. It's just the inverse of ready. So one minus ready is pending. It's pending if it's waiting to be written. Um, why did I change that? I don't know. I can't remember. Um, and then dispatched is true if the instruction has gone down an execute pipeline. So we can we can dispatch out of order and then we're going to keep track of how the um, instructions that have already been dispatched may be uh, dispatched earlier than later instructions in the program. So the logic inside of issue is going to look for a valid entry of the issue queue that doesn't have pending destination, um, sorry, pending operands. So it's not, they're not waiting for their values to be written. And it'll issue the earliest one in program order that is, um, that is valid and not pending and hasn't been dispatched already. Um, and then at the end of the execution, we use the destination field to update the architectural register file if 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 needed. Um, in order to do this, we have to send the issue queue number down the pipeline, and we actually keep instructions in the issue queue as they go down the pipeline. So the issue queue is is going to be sort of storing all of the in-flight instructions um, in it. So the example, again, using our original unoptimized code, in our first um, really decode cycle, in cycle one, the decode stage writes the load word and add i into the issue queue in program order. And the issue logic is going to check and see that there's valid entries who aren't pending. And so we're going to um, we're going to be able to issue them and we'll rename their destinations. So we rename 
R1 and R29 <clears throat> to 0 and 1. So that's the first um, issue of the first two instructions. In the next cycle, the decode logic will put the store word and add I in program order into the issue queue. And it'll say, oh, the store word is waiting for its um, source one, which is actually R29 is source one. So rename register file index one is pending. And rename register file indexed zero is also pending. So its operands are pending. And the same with the add I, it has one operand, $29, rename register file one, which is pending. It doesn't use its source two operand, so that is not pending. Um, and we rename R1, sorry, we rename R29 again, so R29 gets renamed to two. And we issue, <clears throat> let's see, we, we, when we rename R29 to two, we overwrite this pending bit for this add I because this R29 is no longer pending to be written to the architectural register file <clears throat> because there's a later instruction in program order which is going to write to the to R29. So this later instruction in program order supersedes the earlier instructions write of R29. And this way we enforce the write after write precedence. Um, so the earlier instruction writing R29 has its pending bit cleared. We issue the earliest two instructions in program order with non-pending read operands, and they read uh, their operands directly from the register file. In cycle three, the issue queue is full. This is a structural hazard that will stall issue. So we make it bigger. There, I cheated again. You gotta size your issue queue at a minimum, you would want your issue queue to be <clears throat> um, your issue width times your number of pipeline stages between issue and write back. So we'll pretend we have that. We'll pretend we have 10 entries in our issue queue. It was hard for me to draw that many entries in PowerPoint, apparently. So we enqueue the add and the load word onto the issue queue. And when we, when we add them into the issue queue, or really, approximately when we add them into the issue queue. We rename the destinations. So R1 gets a new name. It gets named three. And when we rename R1, we clear the pending bit for the first load word of R1. And we rename $31. $31 gets the new name four. Um, and so these three instructions here are pending to write to R29, R1, and R31. And these instructions are waiting on the rename register file. Um, this one read its value for $2 was read from the register file, architectural register file already, so it's not pending. And then we proceed. In the next cycle, there's gonna be two more instructions that go into the issue queue. At this point, the add I from issue queue entry one completes. Um, it, it, it is in the write back stage, so it completes by writing the rename register file, but it doesn't yet, but it doesn't write to the ARF because the pending bit for its destination is zero. So this add I does not write to the ARF um, because it shouldn't write to the ARF because something else is going to write to the ARF later. So it writes to the rename register file. This way, um, the the later instructions will get the correct value from the rename register file indexed by one that they need. Um, and the issue queue one is no longer valid. It's released and it can be reused, um, but we can't reuse it yet because we have an earlier instruction in program order that's still valid. So we wouldn't be able to allocate this yet until this load word goes away because we have to fill up this issue queue in program order. And then uh, we can issue we can issue the fourth element, this add I, because RRF1 is now ready, and so it's no longer pending. So its operands are not pending, so it can go out of order, just like before it could go out of order. 
uh, in the next cycle, the load word finishes. It also does not write to the register file, uh, the architectural register file rather. It writes only to the rename register file. So now rename register file zero is no longer pending. It's been written and we can free the issue queue um, slot zero. And so at this point, we're going to be able to allocate new instructions into zero and one if we so chose. Um, we still are using instructions in issue queue eight and nine. That's fine. Um, and this store word can be issued and so can this add because it is ready as well. So that store word is issued out of order. And this is where we've got an advantage now. We were able to get this add into the um, pipeline sooner than when we had to block issuing. In the next cycle, two more instructions can go into issue Q0 and 1. The add I here completes. It will write to the architectural register file and to the rename register file because its pending bit for its destination is 1, so it knows it should update R29. And so it updates R29. Um, it writes to the rename register file indexed by, um, by 2. But then it frees the remap entry for R29 because R29 is no longer remapped. R29 is no longer renamed because R29 has been updated with its current value. So you can get the current value of R29 from the architectural register file. Um, then, um, let's see, got lost here. Yes, this ad is now ready to go, so it goes. And no, nah, not this ad. The load word. The load word is now ready to go. The ad went last time. So the load word gets to go. And maybe we can issue something from later in the issue queue. We don't really know what else is left in this program. Um, at this point, we would stall decode because instruction queue slot two is not available. We've run out of um, issue queue entries. That's fine. Um, no big deal. You could have a bigger issue queue, but functionally, we might not be able to keep our pipeline full anyway. Um, our add from here completes. It updates R1 in the architectural register file and releases um, both the remap entry and the issue queue slot. And then um, in the next, oh, we should have finished our store word on that cycle too, I feel like. Missed it. Maybe not. The next cycle of store word completes. The issue queue two is released, and so we can reuse it. One more cycle, the load word completes, updates the architectural register file, and we don't really know what the state of the issue queue is because we don't know what else the program is. The pipeline diagram looks like this. I've introduced a new notation, which is lowercase i. Lowercase i means that it is sitting in the issue queue waiting to be issued. So little i means it's pending. Um, big I means it actually issues. So um, issues or dispatches. So here in cycle six, this store word is able to issue because the load word finishes. So we get the value that the load word loaded, forwarded, um, or really plucked from the um, from the write back into the rename register file. So here this add I issued out of order. So it gets to execute out of order. Um, and so forth. So um, the raw dependencies still cause us to wait for write back before issuing, right? This load use hazard is what serializes this load to this store. But now we can um, we can violate program order in order to execute instructions that don't have the same raw dependencies. Um, and Again, if we make our scoreboard slightly more complicated and we allow to forward from the write back stage into the functional unit pipelines, we can actually have an instruction um, store word here issue and begin the M1 stage here and get forwarded its value um, that it needs to store from the write back stage. But that's that's 
um, just a little bit more complicated yet. So we'll deal with that maybe next time. And that's what the advanced scoreboard is. I think I'm going to pick up from advanced scoreboard next time. I don't know. I thought that was fun. That was fun for me. Was that fun for you?